So my name is Skylar Stewart. I'm with Trimer Environmental, and we are an environmental health and safety company. We focus on environmental health and safety consulting and chemical hazardous waste disposal, as well as regulated medical waste disposal, which is going to be the focus of this presentation. Um, you may have heard uh, before when Allison was speaking, we do have a couple other uh, sustainability initiatives and recycling projects that we work on with a couple other companies, including uh, Sigma Millipore. Um, but we won't really touch on those today. If you want to talk about those, I'll be in the back um, following the presentation. This presentation is going to specifically focus on red to green and some of the sustainability benefits that you can uh, receive from um, recycling your regulated medical waste, stuff that is contaminated that can't be re uh, recycled through normal channels. So just quickly, a brief agenda. We're going to talk about the relationship between Trimer Environmental and Lab Central. Trimer Environmental for short, it's TEI. Um, then we'll dive in uh, to the medical waste management uh, in the United States from a macro perspective. Then we will specify a little bit more on Trimer's red to green program. And finally, we'll wrap up with what benefits you can receive from red to green and what the impact is for your individual organization. So the Trimer Environmental and the Lab Central Partnership goes back quite a ways now. Um, don't hold me to these dates, uh, they're ballpark figures. I think it's about this time, but um, it goes all the way back to 2012 with Cambridge Biolabs, which was the predecessor to Lab Central, uh, predecessor incubator space. Um, so that's where we first were introduced to Johannes. And later in 2012, as we got to know Johannes, he shared his vision of Lab Central with us. And we were very on board and interested about this concept of creating a space where these you know, budding uh, life science companies that have a lot of talent and have a lot of ideas, but not a place to do this work, um, could really focus on what they're going to be doing and, and really take off and not worry about how they're going to keep the lights on. So that was really interesting to us. So that's why we jumped on board and became a founding partner. Um, and we've been involved with Lab, Cent Lab Central ever since. So the following year, construction started in 2013. And we were on board with supporting Lab Central from the beginning. Uh, through that construction process, we provided environmental health and consulting um, support uh, just to make sure that you know, everything was, was being done safely and compliantly. And then as things kicked off and really they hit the ground running, uh, we helped them throughout the process. Skip forward a little bit to 2017 where Harvard Life Labs came on and Bio Labs North Carolina. Uh, we jumped on board and got in partnerships there as well. And then in early 2018, um, our relationship expanded further with the addition of 610 and the second floor here at 700. And then as recently as late 2018, with Biolabs in Philadelphia and San Diego as well. So Triumvirate has been able to grow and support Lab Central as it expands across uh, the United States. Our headquarters is right here in Somerville. So Cambridge is right in our backyard. Uh, but we do have locations up and down the East Coast and we have expanded out West as well and have a presence out in California to help support uh, this type of growth. So specifically, kind of what we do here, uh, we provide daily on-site support services. So we have guys like Alex up here um, in an action shot, <laughs> um, and other folks like Joe that you probably see around the labs. They'll come in and do spot checks and audits for you, um, make sure you guys have all the containers that you need, and they're going to also pick up all of the waste that you produce, the chemical, uh, universal waste, um, non-hazardous waste, and the uh, specifically the topic at hand, the regulated medical waste. Um, we also have a couple other ancillary programs that we do here. We also help manage the wastewater system. I actually just saw Louie, our wastewater guy, run across with a bunch of stuff in his hand, so he's here doing his work right now. Um, we have an on-site consultant, John Beeman, who you've probably seen if you've had us onboarding safety training. He's in the back right there. Everybody wave to John. <laughs> um, we also have a decontamination program as well. So when labs move throughout the, the building or if they move out of the building, uh, their laboratories need to be decontaminated so that the new companies going in have a clean and safe environment to begin their new scope of work. 
Um, and that dovetails pretty nicely with our relocation services. So companies that are moving out and breaking out on their own and need some support, we can help with that relocation and provide um, sort of a program jumpstart and make sure that they have all the environmental health and safety programs in place that they would have at um, a company like Lab Central. So to dive in a little bit deeper into RMW, um, kind of how it's handled and how it's treated, does anybody know how RMW is traditionally treated? Incineration. Incineration. Yeah, that's uh, it's the old school, basic way to do it, uh, and it's the most prevalent right now. So you have incineration, uh, thermal destruction, or um, treatment. And there's a couple other things, lesser known things as well, but those are the two basic things. Either it gets incinerated or it gets thermally treated and autoclaved and then landfilled. So where that stuff's finally ending up is in a landfill or it's incinerated and it's going up as pollution into the air. So to, you can do waste energy as well. So it's, that's the incineration process where heat that's generated from that process is a little bit of it's taken back and utilized, um, which is good. Uh, but the ending results are still going to be land pollution and air pollution, no matter how you, how you slice it. Um, so these are the standard ways of handling this material, and they've been around for decades. Um, and it's a dirty, rough, not glamorous way to handle it, and th that was just the only way to do it. Um, but Triumvirate, as a company, we look at waste streams and we look at problems upstream. Uh, we look at it from the point of generation. We don't necessarily just look at whatever waste is kicked out on the loading dock and ready to be taken away. So we really analyze things from uh, that point of generation. And we knew there just had to be a better way um, from how it's been typically been handled. So here comes the red to green concept. And spoiler alert. It's awesome, but it didn't start that way. Uh, believe it or not, uh, it was not an overnight process. Uh, Red to Greens had a few different um, initiatives that have come out, and originally when we started, we took that, um, that assessment and that consultative approach um, where we would go in and say, there's got to be a better way to handle this. We're going to look at it. We're going to do what we do best and look at these waste streams from the point of generation. We're going to look at what's going into this into this bio waste, who's putting it in there, why are they putting it in there, and what we found, as you wouldn't be surprised, there's a lot of stuff that goes in there that shouldn't be going in there. Um, there's a lot of plastic material, probably the, ma the majority of it's plastics that, that shouldn't be going in there. So our idea was to provide a service offering where we would come in and help talk about this, educate companies, and, and really work on a waste diversion programs. Um, but we found that to be very difficult. Um, in general, it's difficult to change organizational culture and behavior um, from an internal perspective. So especially for an external company to come in and talk to a company about changing their cultural behaviors is really, really tough. Uh, it was an uphill battle. Uh, it worked, but not as well as we would have liked. And it, we really weren't achieving our goals that we had for red to green. So we sat back down and we, we, we looked at what was in the waste stream again? We're like, all right, we've got this plastic that we can't get out of it. So if we can't handle it on the front end, is there a way to handle it on the back end? So can we recycle this plastic? And the short answer was no, because it's contaminated with biologics. But the long answer is, well, if we somehow decontaminated it, then it would be non-hazardous and we could technically recycle it then, right? So we started mulling that question around a little bit more, and we talked to a lot of experts about decontamination processes, about recycling capabilities, about manufacturing, all this stuff that we didn't know too, too much about. And then the more information we got on it, the, the more we realized that there's a, there's a way to do this. And then that's when we really, really got excited about it. Um, and, and once we found out that it was possible and that there was a way to recycle biological waste instead of, instead of incinerating it, that's when we decided to go all in. And how we did that was we bought a facility. We bought a facility out in Jeanette, Pennsylvania. Scenic Jeanette. If you've never been to Jeanette, Pennsylvania, it's a little cow town just outside of Pittsburgh. 
Um, not much going on there, but there's a lot of space uh, to house the equipment that we need. So we purchased this facility right here, um, and we got it permitted to receive and treat regulated medical waste via chemical oxidation um, in accordance with the Pennsylvania DEP uh, regulations. And we also got it permitted as a plastics recycling facility. So this building right here is actually an old airplane hangar. Um, and it was originally used in World War II to manuf manufacture landing crafts. So there's a cool, neat little history there about um, just about innovation and, and production and manufacturing. So we thought that was cool and it was an important part of why we chose that location. Uh, but more importantly, it was a giant space that had a roof over it that could house what we needed to, to do. So <laughs> that was the biggest selling factor. Um, and to my knowledge, it's still the only facility that's permitted and capable of treating regulated medical waste and uh, manufacturing recycled plastic lumber. So to dive into the facility a little bit, uh, it's really broken out into two plants. So we have plant one, which is kind of the dirty side of things. Uh, that's where we receive all of the RMW waste. Um, we cannot receive any hazardous municipal waste or any radioactive waste. So we do the best that we can to filter that stuff out at the generator site. Um, and then we do have a screening process when it comes in to make sure that none of that stuff's getting in our systems as well because we're not permitted to handle that material. Um, but the RMW containers are received and they're scanned for compliance. Um, and then what happens is they get shredded um, and they get chemically treated. So the stuff gets, gets exposed to chemical oxidation, it's rendered non-hazardous, and it's literally grinded and shredded up into what essentially looks like confetti. So you get this like plastic confetti stuff that's non-hazardous now, so now it's just a plastic input. So once that's set, it goes over to plant two, which is our plastics recycling plant, which is just down the way from plant one. And this plant is actually, it's not permitted to receive regulated medical waste, but it can receive plastics. So we do have a lot of uh, plastic take back programs as well, where we can take some of that stuff like, you know, uh, like pipette tip boxes and stuff like that, or anything that you guys have a lot of that you can't figure out a way to reuse in the labs, we can take that stuff and receive it into plant two as well. And a lot of that high quality plastic mixes very well with some of the lower quality plastic that comes from the regulated medical waste. So what happens is um, there, we have several mixologists that we call them out there, and they basically take all this plastic, look at it and be like, all right, what's good, what's bad? And then they take all the other plastic inputs, some of the higher quality stuff that we have, and depending on what, what's getting ordered at the time, they'll mix it into certain specs, and then they will create things like pallets, nailing strips, speed bumps, low-grade construction stuff. Um, but then they can also make some higher quality stuff like landscape timbers, uh, park benches, uh, decking uh, as well. So and that stuff's actually, it's a lot nicer than you would think, um, but it has a lot of applications and it all gets kind of vetted out as to whatever's being ordered at the time in plant two. Um, so just kind of to talk through that real quickly, again, just through a streamlined process. So what we do is we first screen the material on site to make sure that it qualifies to be going to Jeanette. Um, then once it gets received in Jeanette, it goes through the sterilization process. Once it's sterilized, it gets physically separated, grounded up into confetti, and that goes over to plant two for material optimization, where we mix it all up to what we need it to be. And then the extrusion process, where it basically just goes into a big Play-Doh machine, pull the level, lever, and then it all comes out in plastic lumber, lengths cut to whatever you need. Um, we cool it, we test it for integrity to make sure it's good, um, and then it gets shipped off to whoever is ordering it. So from a big picture standpoint, um, before red to green, you've got RMW, the only options are really incineration and landfill, which creates a lot of pollution, um, which, is, which isn't great. It's a dirty result, but um, after red to green, we have a beautiful recycled planet, or at least one small step closer to it. <laughs> um, 
But you may, you're probably thinking, okay, that's great. It's a little bit nicer for me to walk outside, but what does that really do for you and what does that do for your companies now? Um, what's something tangible that we can receive as a benefit from red to green now? Um, you know, why not just go with the cheapest solution as long as we're in, we're in the letter of the law? I mean, why would we invest in a technology like this? Um, and there's a couple answers to that. Um, the first and the, probably the most direct impact, the most, most tangible thing that would relate to you folks is, is things like grant funding. So the I squared SL, which does not roll off the tongue very well, but the International Institute of Sustainable, La Sustainable Laboratories um, has done a lot of work around and a lot of assessment around creating uh, sustainable uh, solutions in labs because they realize that creating sustainable solutions and driving efficiencies through sustainability in labs can create significant economic benefits uh, that can lead to the long-term uh, growth and proliferation of um, these, uh, of these companies. Um, and one thing in particular they've done is they've done a good job at helping define grants that are out there um, and helping with the proposal processes and um, making, that, making those things more accessible um, and helping more of a strategy standpoint and achieving certain granting. Uh, certain grants and fundings. So more specifically, if you look at like I NIH funding, there's actually like a space in there um, when there's a proposal for your NIH funding. And I think it's called like resources and environment or resources sharing and planning or something like that. Um, and if you put some of these sustainability efforts in there, including red to green, you can actually better position yourself and differentiate yourself from other people that are trying to get those funds and put yourself in a, in a better position to to secure those funds for your group. Um, so that's a, that's a quick and easy benefit there. Um, but in general, taking a more macro look at, at it, it, you can really improve product relations and marketability um, through the over-encompassing -com concept of corporate uh, social responsibility. And really all that means is that, um, you know, people are getting less and less excited about working with organizations that are not sustainable. Um, they want to distance themselves from organizations that are not good corporate citizens. Um, so really, uh, all the stakeholders that are involved are people like customers. So customers want to be buying from people who are sustainable. Um, it's difficult to be sustainable. That's why we're talking here. So for a customer, like, how do I do that? Like, well, maybe I'll just partner with people, or maybe I'll just buy from people who are sustainable, and that'll help me. So. Customers are really going to be looking at that. Um, new talent that's out there, new employees that you're looking for. There's a lot of talent out there to be had with a lot of great ideas. Um, but they're looking to be involved in companies that share some of the similar, um, you know, some of the similar like moral concepts of how to be a responsible citizen and how to do that through their business. So they want to be a part of a company that's not only innovative, but also that's going to be socially responsible as well. And then finally, it comes back to funding um, and investors. So investors are going to be looking at companies that are pretty savvy about how they're going to ensure their long-term economic benefits. Um, and one of those things is strategic planning to achieve long-term profits through mitigation of um, environmental and social uh, risks that are out there. So, so that ties into the kind of triple bottom line concept of people, planet, and profit. Um, so the balancing of that and creating some long-term long uh, profitability that can really make sure that your organizations um, have what they need, have the funds, um, and have mitigated the risk so that they can see some of these long-term benefits and be um, you know, successful over the long term. So, uh, so I guess the take-home message is really that uh, the future of business is changing and organizations like Triumvirate that are coming up with ideas like Red to Green um, organizations like Lab Central and NEB, who I'd also like to thank for um, being participants in Red to Green, because if they weren't participating in this program, um, you know, it's not really possible if people aren't um, in making the investment in it. So organizations like ours are really on the forefront of this change, um, and we really hope that if you aren't already on board with it, that after today's uh, speakers, that you decide that, yeah, we want to be on board for that. Thank you.